this side. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Avian Hip Masterclass by Dr. Amesh Sen. I welcome Sen sir to the webinar and uh, uh, request him to please take us through the current concepts of avian femoral head. Welcome, sir. Uh, good afternoon. I'll be talking about what we think in the day of today about avascular necrosis of femoral head. There are some disclosures. That the part of work which I am presenting here has been done with the help of AAG of Hong Kong and AIOD France. When we talk about female head fracture, we know that we are talking about a pathology which can result from either trauma or an intravascular coagulation due to the vascular abnormalities, and very often with alcohol and steroid which lead to a emboli. Eventually, all these things lead to ischemia in the femur head, which undergo eventually the repair as a part of the body general mechanism. But during this process, it loses its structural integrity and it starts getting a collapse. Pickett has described various stages, right from the preclinical to the pre radiographic and a pre-collapse stage when we might see some of the patients, but many may come at the after the collapse, and many of the patients we tend to see when they have a full osteoarthritis. Our co-classification further clarifies about this avian, mainly putting up its location, how medial it is and how lateral it is, as well as amount of area of involvement also whether it's a minimal amount, it's a moderate, that is what we classify as 15 to 30 degree, or it's extensive, that is more than 30% of the femur head involvement. Clinically, some of these patients are likely to present with pain, which could be early, but many cases may be totally painless. The pain is mostly in the groin area, maybe anteriorly, but many of the time, this pain is often confused with the back pain. And many of these patients get work for the back problem rather than a hip problem. Physically, we might find a restriction in the range of movement, and that is what gives a classical sectoral sign when we have got a good range in interlocution and extension, but we have got a limitation in flexed position. Step diagnosis is helpful, but the sensitivity is too low to be taken as a routine diagnostics in the day of today. As comparison, MRI definitely gives a very good diagnostic ability, especially the human image with the sickle band like area of low skin density and T2 image with the second high density line along with the T1 line, uh, along with C3 images and such. 
in the MOI picture, we can describe their location and we can describe the angle which the area of heat is involved. And accordingly, what we label at A plus B, the area of involvement in AP view and in corner view, we can define it out that how much the area is, taking, whether it's more than 240 degree, then it's a high risk of collapse, if it's a moderate risk, and accordingly, the classification can be done. Very important, this perspective is to differentiate it from a nearby diagnosis of transient osteoporosis, which is a self-limiting problem, can happen in women during the pregnancy. It may be there in the men also, in six decades. And important is that this edema extends down to the metaphysical area also. If we do bone perfusion, we are likely to get much better diagnosis of the avascularity by MRI contrast type. And these help us to make a better diagnosis when we are talking about the further progress. Lately, we have been able to look at the other perspective of use of F18 fluoride positron emission tomography also, which is also fine to be reasonably sensitive, almost equal to MRI and equal in specificity to MRI in the patients where you cannot get an MRI done, this 18 fluoride uh, PET CT is one of the options. And the agreement between the MRI picture it is around 96%. A very important thing to know is that the diagnosis does not have any clinical criteria. Either it is X-rays, where we can see a joint space narrowing, we can see a collapse of the head, we can see sclerosis in the femur head, or it is the scan where we see cold and hot, or it is the classical MRI picture of bands, or it is histology. And the definite diagnosis is any two positive criteria out of the five listed. We have done an epidemiological profile of these cases in India. And what we have seen, we have a bilateral cases in 54% of the cases. And we are talking bilaterally, if we do rule out traumatic cases and non-traumatic, it is about 60%. We have found steroid to be the most common cause, followed by idiopathic, then near closes alcohol, and then comes trauma as a cause of alien and other population. Very important perspective in avian presentation is that many cases present at the footprint level of these stages. We found in our 382 cases of avian, 48% presented at stage 2, 33 presented at a stage 3, and 16 presented at stage 4 of the ARCO distribution. And that's very important that we do not get all these cases at an early stage. Question comes on this, can we define a steroid dose which is important. What has been seen in the literature is that if we are giving steroids more than 16.6 mg a day, there is 3.4 fold higher chances of getting an avian than if the dose is less than 12. Likewise, kidney transplant patients who get more than 20 mg per day pregnancy on about a five times higher risk of developing avian in their patients. There has been a very good paper from India regarding the link of homocysteine and concomitantly reduced level of vitamin B6 and B12 in plasma in these patients who are getting or had, and this is published in the Nature as an innovative there. Now, when we look at the pronostic indicator, what is defined here is the amount of involvement, and that itself is one of the main criteria when we look at the outcome whether it's a minimal involvement, whether it's more involvement, and likewise, whether it's a medial area or a central area. Now, when we look at the amount of area involved, we understand that MRI does give us an area involvement, but volumetric assessment, if it is done, that is supposed to be a much better method of assessment of the amount of involvement. Though it is not a very practical method, most of the places, it's more a study method. What happened actually in this patient? If the femur had involvement is significant, the lesion is large, usually they do not reduce. Smaller lesions which do not affect much of the weight bearing area, they may not see 
but they may have a more discontinued kind of a change, but larger regions never reduce as been observed. I want to give this presentation a very old group. In 1997, we operated it for a neglected dislocation here. We could see on the MRI the changes in the tumor and the vascularity. We monitored this patient in 98, also the changes were there. The x rays also saw changes. The patient was asymptomatic. After three years, the patient was still asymptomatic. And even seven, eight years later, also he was now becoming symptomatic. Then he started feeling problem while the X-ray pictures was reasonably bad. And then after technically eight years of getting the coma and getting sick, he had reasonable amount of a symptoms which demanded a replacement at that stage. A point to note is that many of these cases may remain symptomatic for a very long time of even being diagnosed in the radiology. The MRI picture, they may still be medically symptomatic. If we are careful, especially when we have got a case with a neglected dislocation and we are doing the open addition, we have experimented with that if we aspirate from the femur head and if we look at the amount of aspirate what we obtain over there, if that amount is less than one cc with the 18 pass needle, usually this is likely to be a vector. And this is what we have published subsequently that in this period, in those cases, because we tend to deal with a lot of neglected cases, there is always a query that whether the set is viable or not. One option is we can get an MRI scan and then we can find it out. Another option on the table is that we can aspirate it out and look for it. And usually these cases will manifest in the radiology technically around third month of the trauma. Now we go to the current scenario of what it is. It has been conventionally expected that the restricted weight bearing will solve the problem. But this is one of the papers which says there is no difference in the pathological changes whether the patient bears weight or doesn't bear any weight. So weight bearing does not bring any change in the outcome. And that is what all meta-analysis have also supporting that weight bearing restriction is not a management basis. There has been a talk about statin therapy and it has been given that if they are given for along with this device, they may be a kind of a protection from the avascular necrosis, that is what the literature says about it. People have looked at hyperbaric oxygenation also, which can bring a relief to anemia in these cases. People have tried pulse electromagnetic field stimulation also in many of these studies and they found they reduce the uh, involvement and they decrease the serum lipid levels, it could be helpful in this situation. Extra carbon shockwave have also been tried, whether it is given with alendronate or without alendronate, it has been seen that it itself is effective, but it is very important in the relatively smaller cases. Then anticoagulants have also been tried, this is one of the review, which says they could be useful if the vascular coagulopathies are a cause in this kind of a situation. And they have not seen any side effects in this kind of situation. Another medicine, Doprost, has also been looked to reduce the edema. But many of these cases, eventually, you can see in the literature 20% that are go to stage 71% of the stage 3 are eventually likely to go for a DHR in these cases also. And a very controversial thing remains bisphosphonates. First report regarding bisphosphonates came from a Red study, the experimental study in 2002. Subsequent in red scannings and in nature, things, another studies were done, and all of them actually proved that it reduces the prevalence of collapse in patients in the uh, animals. Uh, this was for its activity. And then it made one of the studies in JDJS in 2005, and this was a RCT which said yes, it could be useful in inhibiting the osteoplast activity which resorbs curtains. There is an option. And then came another study from India which said, it, yes, it could lead to improvement in the clinical status and the disability score, and we can reduce the incidence of a hip replacement in all these patients. A very interesting uh, paper has come in 2014 which says that because it takes about three months for a newborn to follow with an effective mechanical properties, 
and it only takes three weeks for the osteoclast to reduce the mechanical strength. So there may be a role of building up the slowing down of the osteoclast, building up the strength, reducing the uh, effect of the osteoclast in that area. That could be one of the mechanism in the use of electrophysics. Now there are two reviews which have been published in the literature. This review published in 2014 had four papers by Agarwala in their review analysis, and they said that their findings support the consideration of alendronate use in adult avian, especially in the early size, early stage, in the small necrophytic. But another review in 2014 again did not include any paper of this in the Agarwala, and they concluded that there is still a lack of strong evidence for supporting the application of alendronate in adult patients with non traumatic behavior. So, it is just one author's publication which has made the difference, the two reviews in the conclusion regard alendronate. Now, what are the surgical interventions? We understand fluid decompression has been very validated, very well validated in the meta analysis regarding its usefulness in these cases. There has been a change in the perception that whether we have to make a big drill hole or we can do with the smaller drill holes into the femur head. And now what is conceived that if we want to reduce the chances of fracture subsequently happening in the neck, we can come down to cinnamon pin or 4 millimeter size or 5 millimeter size, where you can do a decompression at multiple points it's as effective as a bigger drill hole made over there. When we look at the literature, there have been a variation in the outcomes reported from the core decompression. Various series have different rates of success reported at a different number of intervals. If compared to a restricted weight bearing, the core decompression definitely scores much better in the management, and this has been definitely found it out to be much better strategy to manage rather than simply leave the patient on restricted weight. MRI evaluation has also been done after core decompression and it has observed that there are good outcomes in grade A and B reason. Group C reason, however, the chances of collapse still stay, though the patient becomes uh, pain for a short term. And basic benefit of the pain comes basically for reduction for myroid arm. When we say about post traumatic avian, we do differentiate into three kinds of post traumatic avian, either a small infarct or a relatively shallow lesion, or a large area occupying most of the tumor head. This is one of the repeat series of one, more than 1,000 cases where it has been found that the incidence of 6.6% is there regarding then It is expected to be more in displaced fracture, expected to be more in women, and relatively more in younger age patients as compared to the elderly patients. Like this, there could be a worldwide kind of an impaction which goes for an avian and patient where it becomes symptomatic to have the effect of the hip drive. Interestingly, if you look at this paper published in 2015, it says there are no studies which are devoted to the management of post-traumatic avian using cold decompression of the technology. And since the results cannot be directly applied to these patients of the findings which are done in a non traumatic avian to a traumatic avian. Now, whether this same core decompression can be used in isolation, it says no. Because the etiology is different, so we may not expect the same outcome of post traumatic avian as we are expecting in a non traumatic avian. We did publish one of the series on. Medic avian of decompression, and what we observed was much poorer as compared to when we did a cold decompression non traumatic avian. While there we are expecting in the early stages an uh, outcome of about 70 to 80 percent good outcome in post traumatic cases, our outcome never increased more than 50 percent of these cases. That is what we said in this paper. We did public review also subsequently where we said it that whatever the core decompression is still uh, one of the safe management in these cases, but there is always an opportunity to increase the outcome of core decompression as such. Now, increasing the outcome, one could be just add alendronates because we have seen that in some of the cases it could be useful. So this is one attempt which has been made 
that it can definitely help by adding a lendronate treatment to the cold decompression treatment. Now we also understand that when we have got steroid induced avian, there is likely to be alteration in the differentiation of mesenchymal cell cell where they create a lot of fat cells in between the osteoblasts. And in this type of a situation, there is an expectation that if you add bone marrow cells, it might be helpful in the management of these cases. And this is one of the first publications which was made by Harnik regarding the autologous bone marrow grafting in famous process. There he published this, and it was published as an abstract in this journal, and that it is a useful kind of a management option. Subsequently, we got another papers by him as well as Pragangis regarding the surgical technique of using stem cells here. But still in 2006, in this review by Mont, they have found it out that this multipotential stem cell, we have still insufficient evidence to make any recommendation. In that very year, we started working on autologous bone marrow stem cells under the AID and the AID Hong Kong sponsored research schools. We had a good number of cases of steroids. We, had over, we made it an RCT randomized control trial in these cases, divided the bit randomly, and then the technique was using a FICO separation method after centrifuging, washing them, analyzing the strength, analyzing their count. Now, as an example, this was one of the case. You can see the two hips and it's the MRI picture. It's quite a significant involvement. Here we have only 10 core decompression. But in spite of cold decompression, it got a collapse on one side and subsequently the other hip also was significantly symptomatic. In comparison, this non-traumatic avian where it was idiopathic in nature, we can see in the MRI pictures the amount of involvement and the kind of a restriction he has in sitting posture. This is the cold decompression surgery which we did with this smaller 4.5 millimeter thin man pin. He got a bit better clinically in six months time. In 18 months, he was much better clinically with a relatively better range of movement. And seven years later, he was still having good range of movement. And we can see the residual changes in the tumor head, but he's maintaining all his abilities as well still. Another patient of Hodgkin's lymphoma who was being treated on steroid, developed AVN. You can see those MRI images of a vascularity in the MRI picture. And then this is the code decompression biopsy, whatever we did at that. And this is eight years later. On left side, there is a collapse, but our ability to sit is quite okay in life. Hip is perfectly normal in that case in the day of today also. Another patient where we had the changes, you can see in the MRI pictures on the either side of it, that was in 2009 when we induced. The installation of stem cell and he's nine years later in 2017 his hips are as normal as anything with a very good range of movement in the both the hip rates in this case another patient of sle having a bilateral avian one hip was reasonably bad in that side we did a thr the another side we did is have the installation of these marrow cells in the area after core decompression and nine years later you can see he's maintaining a hip as well the other side is definitely the THR, but with all those these things, which, uh, nine years later also we have today good outcome. Another patient with the same kind of a situation, one hip was significantly bad requiring THR, but the other hip we gave a stem cell as an installation as a management after the code compression. And this was in 2007 when we did this surgery and added stem cells into the area. And this is 10 years later, you can still see his hip has survived really in the moment is as good in the 10 years following also. Then we have got another patient where we got a failure here. Here we did the same thing, but in this patient, there was a restriction to the range of moment, and definitely there is a collapse also. So we did have one of those cases getting into the problem. Now here, we analyzed those these things in 2011, and then we published this paper in 2012 as a randomized control study in the journal for Thurplasty. And what we concluded, and this was similar to other studies in the literature also, that there is an improvement after adding these stem cells into this area. And there are in the literature to say, yes, they could be useful in this kind of a situation. Then subsequently, many other papers appeared regarding the usage of these stem cells into this area. We did publish in 2013 another paper 
that yes, it was a kind of review that there is definitely likely to be a role of these progenitor cells into the area. Then this was a review article published in 2014 where there were five papers from the literature regarding the clinical side, including ours, and which all concluded that definitely stem cell therapy has a role in the management. Another systemic review also appeared in the same year in 2014. Again, they included six, seven papers in this thing, including ours, and they also concluded the same way, likely to be a role of stem cells in the management. Another publication appeared, a seven case control style, including that of ours, and again, they also showed that giving uh, stem cell management would be a good option in managing the Another review appeared in 2017. The 11 studies had been accumulated, which were good according to their standard with 507 patients, including ours, and definitely there also the conclusion had not changed. Another article subsequently as a literature-based systemic review appeared, again saying the same thing that yes, it is. So there is a enough number of review articles and meta-analysis which have been done in those periods, and this is all subsequently concluded by Philip Harnig, the master who started the process, that it is a 30 year review progress where he said it yes, the availability of stem cells and low with oxygen property through bone marrow transplantation when injected, they do secrete angiogenic cytokines, resulting in increased genesis. And they can lead to the formation of new blood cells by the presence of the progenitor cells and angioblast in the progression. Now, the question was can we still make it better? So people started adding BMPs into these stem cells, elevating the number of new bones and accelerated it here also in this kind of situation. Then there came a role of autologous cultured cells also. And this was a case report which was published long time back. And then subsequently in 2010, we also tried using this cultured cell and we found a significant difference and a very early change in the team ahead also as far as the uh, quality of the bone was concerned after these culture cells. Then people tried different method, different identity and delivery of constructed narrow cells into the femur also. 2015 guidelines, if you look at it in the World Journal of Orthopedics, says very interesting thing. Whatever the stage of disease, whether stage 1, whether 2A, whether 2B, or whether 2C, all these stages, when you think of solid, they have included bisphosphonates in all stages. They have included these bone cells, stem cells in all these stages. Now in stage 2 and stage 2B, they did combine osteotomy also as one of the options for. And they had a bone less bone grafting also as one of the options for. But incidentally, interestingly, bisphosphonates and these stem cells have been added in all these stages. Till you go to the stage 4, when they say you can go in for a and it is a Then we further went into a situation, do we really need, in stage one, when there is just an edema, do we really need stem cells? We again analyzed, because we have not published this part of the study. We took 59 patients, we again divided into two groups. Some patients of stage one, we only did cold decompression. While in stage two, we did cold decompression and bone marrow stem cells in, in the cases. And we incidentally did not find any difference. So meaning by in early stage when there is edema only, there may not be much role of stem cell at that stage. There is no necrotic cells are there. So maybe as we relieve edema by doing a core decompression, we get the same outcome as we get in stage two when there is a necrotic uh, cells also where we need to put stem cells in this kind of a situation. Now, we have in past using non vesicles for grafting also. And in this non vesicular grafting, there is an expectation that they are likely to support mechanically the A graft also. And this has been validated in a number of small studies that, yes, when you combine the bone impaction into the area of necrosis, this cortical grafting could be a useful situation. And even the, one of the recent papers in 2015 also supports this very perception of use of non uh, cancer grafting also the cortical grafting and now we have been using this little technique of getting into the femur head getting an expansion on the cutting medium getting space and putting up a bone graft into this kind of area to improve upon the outcome in the relatively late stages also we have done few things of light bulb procedures also and it's expected they might give us a good result and then we have done 
to vascularize fibrils, so which is supposed to which is supposed to be the gold standard in the management of vascular necrosis this is one such case of a vascularized fibula the situation was reasonably bad we went for the microvascular grafting along with the fibula over there and this is 11 years follow up he is able to maintain it as well after a drop period also and when we looked at the outcome in the literature also there are various levels of the outcome uh, of good outcome in these cases also where the vascular fibula has been able to give us a reasonable kind of a outcome in these cases also now vascularized ileocrest grafting is also one of the standard technologies here which has got a reasonable amount of a studies done and they say it is also one of the methods of using uh, vascularity into the femur head which may not really require that level of expertise and it could be one of the options then people tried combining ileoc bone graft sartorius graft as well as ileoc vascular graft also and they found the clinical success rate can be increased in all these cases trap door is another method which has been said to be an important management in the past and fibular graft now this is something which we are using a portable graft only which was very conventional and there have been people which they say that there could be reasonable kind of an outcome in using a non vascularized graft also we have a feel that it's primarily a mechanical support which we are giving to the rather than a biological support in this kind of a situation we have been using in the past this muscle pedicle grafts also providing either from the quadrators or from the rectus and one or from uh, in that area and they have been studies which say that they have been able to get a very good outcome in many of their cases so the percentage has gone quite high in some of the literature reports also but again that the effort has been going on and it is one of the recent paper where sartorius muscle pedicle graft has also been used in the vascularization uh, and along with the literature it has been said to be either the literature has been plus minus about it but then there is a reasonable number of good cases reported when we look at the literature of vascularized graft again it varies you can see in the early stages it is as good at 74% to 82% in the late stage there is a step to go down in these cases also people have tried particular metal in that too using along with the osteoblast also or along with these stem cells also and when they were using stem cells the results definitely have been said to be better in this now what the osteotomy is now problem with the osteotomy is in for a case for osteotomy the problem is that significant area of superior or inferior is often involved and then the basic expectation out of osteotomy is that we may be able to bring a normal part of the femur had to bear the weight very area so that usually does not happen in many of these cases with the significant amount of involvement only if the area of involvement is small there this osteotomy is like helpful and then regarding this physio per rotation osteotomy obviously as most of us believe it is definitely not a very easy procedure and not very many people are likely to be able to get the same results as when you obtain by the master surgeons themselves then people did try using a vascularized graft along with the osteotomies also again with an effort that we can increase the rate but overall when we look at the results they have always been in between and quite inconsistent in most of the studies whether you are talking about rotation osteotomies we are talking about annulation osteotomies interestingly just to keep the sphericity of the femur head some new method like cementation of the femur head it may be able to give us good years But including they they have tried these methods also, and they have found it out. It could be one of the methods also. And lately, we have also seen the papers which they say they are using alendronate insulation into the femur head, basically with the perception that it's likely to decrease the chance of its collapse subsequently in this kind of a situation. With the advancement, now people are using that to do some stupid graft also with this area, and they feel with the techniques available now. just they have been using the knee joint the hip joint also we can take care of the pieces and settle them out and now even allograft osteochondral graft have also been tried and more and more papers are coming up in this kind of a situation now regarding the advancement in metallic addition into it is this umbrella shape and then the shape memory alloy and devices also which are being used we understand this is are now being done as an experiment we have to wait for the potential results to so come and like like hemi the bus we have a hemi cap now which can be 
used in the area after taking out the necrotic area, filling it with it, and what we might have to see for many years, the results which come out of the studies uh, of using. Now, regarding hip replacement, initially there was a perception that hip replacement is avian because it is likely to be in a problem with the underlying ischemia bone. But lately, there is a difference in the perception of the late literature. They say there be a high rate of a medical complication in these cases. Reading transmission chances could be more in these cases. But still, the results are not as bad. The only case here which we have to take it that they are relatively younger patients. And being young patients, we have to use the implants which can save part of the bone on either side, the stem side also as well as toward the cup side also. And likewise, the bearing surfaces should be as consistent as like a ceramic to ceramic or ceramic to highly cross poly, which gives a reasonable number of years before they get one revision because they are expected to go for a sick that time to come. So there has been a lot of um, choices now which can be used according to the age of the patient depending on the age of the Now this is one of the those cases of so-called ASR problem. This was the case which came to us in 2007. One hip was already bad. We at that stage did not do anything, but the other hip which was salvageable, we did that installation of stem cells in that side. But in nine, when the other side, we went for the CHR at that stage, ESR was available. So we did this thing. Now in 2018, she came with a significant involvement around the ESR cup. While on the other side, the femur head where we had done a uh, stem cell installation is still as best as it was there in 2007 we did a stem cell installation. So there definitely is a role for stem cell while on the other side it has to be properly taken care of what implant is to import. Now this is another paper which also said there is no significant difference regarding the outcome of a THR in these pieces of PFA modes. And this is another paper in 2016 says there is no difference between avian osteoarthritis as regarding THR. So the initial perception that THR and avian is not as good now is getting dissipated due to the later studies which are coming and find no difference in these cases also. So they have found it out that if we do other procedures before coming to a THR, there could be an issue in the outcome and that could affect the eventual outcome of the THR in this type of a group. So, in the day two of today, when we look at all around in this subject as such, we see that for the diagnosis, we have to go for the clinical if it is there or for the radiological perspective where MRI is a very, very important tool in the management and maybe bone scan can help when MRI is contraindicated and that you have to be a right vaccine is one of the options. As far as the management is concerned, our protocol still remains that if we are stage one, there is a ligma primarily, we only do core decompression. However, if you look at the last line down there, we add disc solids in all three stages, first, sec second, and third. But in stage one, we are consistently doing core decompression. In stage two, when we expect that area has become necrotic, that area is defined now, and with the wall, so we tend to break that in a wall do the cold decompression and then we tend to add stem cells because now we perceive this area needs enough number of cells because they are necrotic cells. And this is exactly the stage if the facilities exist, one can go for vascularized graft, vascularized fibra also in this kind of a situation. In a stage three, or as you can see, a stage too late, when we think the patient sign is appeared, the people is likely to collapse or it is almost to collapse, where we think that we are is in need of a cortical structure. Supporting that area, it could be a fibular graft and it could be combined with the cancer bone grafting into that area. That could be one of the options for till the patient becomes reasonably involved with the arthritic changes and then we have no other choice but to go for arthroplasty. But again, this arthroplasty has to be defined for a relatively younger patient with the expectation that he is likely to be a subsequent HR later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think everybody was watching the webinar. So yes. currently, there are no questions as such in the group. Okay. But uh, I think the questions will be coming up as soon as we end the webinar. And you Great. can take them live for next half an hour or as for your timing. Quite okay. So we will be on WhatsApp. Yes, sir. 
किया सर ओके थैंक यू वेरी मच सर ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीबडी